Good morning, I'm Mark Allen with Gaper.io, and I'm here today with Chris Hutrop, the CEO uh, of Online Carry Training. Good morning, Chris, how you doing? Hey, good morning, Mark, how are you doing? I'm doing well, another, another nice day here in San Francisco. What's it like where you are? Uh, it's cold, snowy, and cloudy. Wow. Up in up your Minneapolis, but it's supposed to be nice going forward, uh, starting later this afternoon, so well, glass is half full. <laughs> well, hopefully it stays like that for a while. So to start with, can you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur. So my first company was when I was eight, my sister was uh, 10. We had a con candy stand mm. because there were too many lemonade stands in our neighborhood. So we kind of did the blue ocean strategy there uh, and uh, basically took that little itty bitty company, grew it. Uh, and made enough money that summer where my sister bought a horse. So mm. um, that was kind of the <laughs> the first bout of entrepreneurship in my life and everything. And then from there, I grew up. I always had lawn care companies or brush removal companies in my teens. And um, I ended up going to school to uh, Northwestern, um, not the Northwestern Chicago, but one in uh, St. Paul. And uh, after uh, graduating from there, I sold life insurance uh, for Northwestern Mutual. And I made a, a lot of money for about a year, and but I just got bored mm. uh, with it. So on the side for fun, I started teaching uh, here in Minnesota um, some, uh, some educational courses around firearms training for people who wanted to, to learn how to, how to safely use them and own them and everything. And quickly grew that company in about a month to the point where I was making more money on the side for fun uh, teaching these classes than I was all month in the day in my day job. So I took that company and grew it kind of what it is today, which is one of the largest uh, firearms training companies in the country, online carry training. Um, we operate in about 34 states, uh, uh, teach uh, a plethora of courses, but primarily around permit to carry or conceal carry in some states is what they call it. Um, and basically from there, uh, went out and um, got feedback from a lot of our students that uh, this was 2012, uh, or correction, yeah, yeah, mid-2012, that they were um, having trouble finding um, ammunition um, for, for shooting. So on the side, you know, we kind of started exploring that and said, well, you know, there must be a, there must be a way to try to figure out to, to, to jump the supply chain because there's a big increase in demand. And uh, basically went there and started an ammunition manufacturer, raised uh, capital from uh, fantastic investor um, um, who's still a friend of mine and everything and uh, basically broke into a niche of the ammunition industry that primarily targeted uh, no pun intended uh, government contracts for the U.S. military specifically in precision calibers so long distance or niche weird um, oddball stuff uh, and then we uh, exited that business about three three and a half years ago now um, and then from there, started a, a retail business, uh, started a tech company, started a service-based company with my brother uh, and everything, or I should say I helped him out. He did a, a great job on his own. And then finally, from there, I went out and uh, moved on to uh, uh, a medical device uh, and, and working inside of a medical device startup and everything. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the gist of it. I was joking around and saying professionally ADD. Because uh, I do a little bit of everything, but you know, I really enjoy doing the startup phase um, of of companies. So getting in there, building the team out, which is really the key factor of success of any company is having a good team, uh, and then growing that uh, from there and getting good people involved. And I'm currently involved in a in an accelerator that uh, I help found and everything, and we're working, you know, with startups and everything on side of that, trying to take away some of those risk factors, but also augment things a little bit differently. So Space Accelerator, um, based here in Minneapolis, where you know, I'm currently doing a lot of projects at and everything, uh, is uh, is kind of an interesting uh, interesting venture for sure. So yeah. Wow, that's quite a lot. You're a busy guy. Yeah. And, and yeah. It, from the sounds of it, you've only been an employee for about a year. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, we only worked for someone for about a year. That and I was... Uh, <laughs> When I was 14, I worked at a golf course driving those little carts that pick up the balls in the driving range. Mm -hmm. After a season of that, I got, <laughs> I was too jittery from people trying to hit me in it with the golf balls that uh, <laughs> I just went on my own, I guess. So, but it's been fun, you know, it's, it's, it's what I was, you know, kind of created to do and, and made to do. So it's kind of fun to sort of live that calling, you know, every day. So 
and I have to admit, being a golfer, I did. I have tried to hit the golf cart guy. I, I don't anymore. I, I, I matured a little, but there was a time in my life where, yes, I did that. <laughs> so, so what has been your experience with remote employment? It, it sounds like you've had it in, in various capacities in your career. Yeah, so that's what's kind of interesting, right? So a lot of the, the companies that I founded or, or worked with, you know, you're, you're typically bootstrapping things, right? And when you look at any given market, like there's pros and cons to going out there and using re remote work. You know, one of the big pros though is that, you know, the, the probability of, you know, the talent that you need in your geographical area is relatively low compared to the rest of the world, right? Especially when you're looking at, like up here in Minneapolis, it's a very competitive market for developers, right? It's really hard to find good developers who are looking for work, right? They can get a job in two seconds. But if I go out there and I can work with, you know, a developer in Argentina, or I can work with a developer uh, team in India, and they're one third or one tenth the price of a developer here, it allows you to get a lot more traction on that. You can move things faster. You know, you can work with teams in different time zones so you can keep things rolling out and kind of daisy chaining them. So there's a lot of pros to it. You know, the downside is they're not on site, right? So there's there's negatives to that, but I think some of those barriers are starting to be broken. Um, and a lot of that's, you know, accelerated by kind of the coronavirus pandemic and everything. Yeah, I think it's actually made it um, more acceptable for people. More People are more willing to accept remote work now. And so just by the nature of that, they're, they're looking for solutions and just said, because people like two years ago would say, nah, that's, that won't work for us, right? And now it's like, well, it, we've been we've been doing it now by default and it does work, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's like, you know, at the end of the day, like humanity's ability to adapt to situations is, is you know, kind of unprecedented, right? Like our ability to, you know, work inside of a certain framework is, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of amazing, right? So it's like, I had a number of entrepreneur friends of mine who own businesses, you know, 40, 50, 60 employees. And, you know, one of them was very much so, you know, liking to have his, you know, employees on site there every day, show up, wear suits, the whole nine yards. Well, <laughs> they yeah. weren't able to do that for the past six months. And he's having the best year he's ever had, right? Yeah. Now, it, you know, is that directly due to, you know, them working remotely? Probably not. But it goes to show that they can perform at a higher level than they ever have before because, or even, even with working remotely, you know, but it really does come down, I think, to the individual employee. I mean, some people, you know, can do it and some people can't do it and some people shouldn't do it. Right. I think those are three different things, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, I think it does come down to the individual. Um, I've been doing it for over 10 years. So to me, it's second mm -hmm. nature. Um, but to other people, I mean, other people were thrust into it. If you have little kids at home and it, it's very hard, mm -hmm. but I mean, my youngest is 30, so that's really not an issue. For me right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you think is the future of remote employment and what do you think can be done differently to make it more effective? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I mean, I think the biggest crux with remote employment from a owner or an entrepreneur perspective, right, is the fear that someone's gonna be working remote and they're not gonna be doing their job, right? So it's really that accountability factor. And it really comes down to management, right? Like how 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 can you manage that person better? And you know, I'll caveat this by saying that there are some people you just they just can't work remotely, right? Um, you know, a big thing is you have to trust the person. You know, you have to know that they're gonna do their job and they want to do their job and they want to be there. You know, I'm I'm guessing if we look back, you know, probably at employees who you know, we're kind of on their way out psychologically, they probably have used, you know, some of this work remote as kind of their way to sort of sit back and relax while some of the stuff has happened. You know, on the other side of the equation, some people are very capable, right? They're driven, they're motivated. And frankly, those are the employees you want anyways, right? You don't want dead weight on your team that you're mm -hmm. paying to sit around there and babysit. So that's the caveat. Um, but I think, you know, really the, to answer your question, like what's the, what is that? future kind of look like is I think you're going to see the increase. I think people, some of the stuff is going to stick. And a lot of these companies who are paying for class A office space, you know, they're, they're paying 20, 30, 40, $50 a square foot, mm -hmm. you know, for these beautiful offices, they're realizing, oh, we don't need to do that. You know, that goes right back to the bottom line, especially in a small to medium sized company, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you have some of these really big companies, you know, up here in Minneapolis, like Medtronic, 
um, and they're basically almost their entire workforce, you know, and they have like over 200,000 employees or something like that are working remotely if they can work remotely, right? Like manufacturing, you can't, but if you have a, you know, an office job, you know, they're, they're doing that, right? So it'd be interesting to see, you know, what ripples are created further inside like the real estate industry, you know, I, you know, is class A office space going to crater, you know, as a, as a result of that, or are there going to be companies that say, you know what, like, we could work remote. Why are we worried about hiring someone here in Minneapolis? And you know, one of my friends um, basically asked himself that question. He owns a business, and you know, his big thing was like, it's so much easier now to go out there and recruit. So, you know, Minneapolis is probably a medium to yeah. upper medium standard of living from an expense perspective. You know, you're in San Francisco, which is a lot higher. You know. But, you know, imagine if you could find a high, high quality person, but they live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, mm-hmm. you know, that person compared to someone who lives in Manhattan or San Francisco might need to make half as much as you do mm-hmm. uh, because they have such, you know, much cheaper cost of living. So from a budgetary perspective, you're saving money now on your rent. So you don't have to pay, you know, rent to get that high expense. And then number two, you're seeing the, you know, the ability to save money on the, the personnel, you know, that could be obviously very crucial for, for big companies. But I think, I think in small business, you're going to see that that be the big norm because most people have always had that mantra like where they consider it and they say, oh, I'm just going to dismiss this idea of working remotely because for some reason it's not going to work. People are going to be lazy. They're not going to do their job. Well, they just all been forced to do it for the past six months for the most part, or a lot of people have. And I think that's going to start breaking that status quo and it's, you know, frankly, a good thing, right? It's almost this creative destruction where, you know, areas that may have been, you know, kind of pseudo economically depressed are going to get this influx in revenue because, you know, in the middle of Iowa or in the middle of Nebraska, this person's making $150,000 a year as a developer when normally he had to drive to Omaha and he's making 95, right? So it brings that inside there. It's not so much about just getting money and redistributing it by any means it's more so about creating competition in the market so now you know a, a business owner can be more profitable or more competitive inside that market they can charge us for the product or service which then gets passed on to the end user at the end of the day the end customer right if you know you're you know own a point of sale company and it's cheaper for you to run and cheaper for your competitor to run it means it's going to be cheaper for you know mom and pop retail store to have that product. And that means more money in their pocket at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's just kind of this, this ripple effect yeah. that's created by there and ultimately want to, you know, create competition. And I think this helps break down the barriers and then open up more competition to the market. So. Yeah, I agree. It, it's interesting. You mentioned Sioux Falls. I'm, I'm actually consulting for a company now uh, part-time at the lead developers out of Sioux Falls. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the company that I'm consulting for is based in Irvine, California. So, <laughs> and and literally if the guy were to leave it would be devastating to the company he's he's really talented <laughs> he's doing mm-hmm. a great job so i know what you mean it's it's absolutely true um and who would have thought it you know 10 years ago right someone in irvine like i'm gonna hire someone in south dakota no way so um so what um what is the story behind online carry training um and you said you've been in business for what since eight years now yeah, eight years now. So really, I mean, the main story behind it is that, you know, when we started teaching classes, we were, we were limited on how how many of these classes we could teach. So we kind of, have one of the first companies to go out there and start doing online training for firearms. There's a number of states where you can actually do that. And obviously, we always recommend like, hey, go out there and get, you know, in-person instruction. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, if someone wants to do this permit, you know, and get that, you know, we just want to provide them the, the best way to do that. Right. So we also offer like instructor resources and stuff like that. So they can get the, the in-person piece. But primarily we actually do a lot of our, our training virtually to be able to, to give people some of the basic level instructions. Mm-hmm. There's some things you just can't learn on a video and we don't really offer courses in that area. We always refer that out. Um, but uh, it's kind of a, it's an interesting, uh, an interesting business for sure. You know, around there has been, it's worked pretty well for us. And we've had a really good team. And a lot of our team members actually have been re- remote, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, I've had team members that worked in a company from India to Spain to Pennsylvania. Wow. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, it's like the way that the company is structured and we built it from the ground up was 
allowed for that, right? And it's just a matter of how good of a manager am I or my team at making sure that you know, we're still moving those projects forward and we're getting everything done that we need to. But we've had a lot of success with that. You know, you know, we've probably saved, I'd say, 30 to 40 percent consistently, as opposed to having to hire people locally here in the Minneapolis market. And on top of that, there's you know some things that we need to have done that we just, there isn't the talent for here in in Minnesota. You know, like you know, find specialists in these you know small niche pieces of software that we were developing. Like there's 20 people in the world, you know, or 100 people world right who who have experience in that right so it's easier to to work with those folks than try to find a development shop here they have no experience and you're basically trying to you know get them to learn on your dollar and everything so it's nice to be able to kind of go remote on that and in fact you know one of our gals is based out of arizona hmm. you know who does a lot of our consulting on uh, on the it side of the equation because that's what she specializes in is this particular you know hmm. specific piece of software that we utilize She's very good at it. And she's yeah. <laughs> about one third the price of a normal developer. <laughs> yeah. No. You know, that we would that we would get here because she's in rural Arizona, you know. So yeah. it's great. Makes and, and just out of curiosity, what percentage of of Terry, you know, can someone learn online? I mean, you, as you said, you some of it you have to do in person, but what percent can you do online before you have to go to the in-person thing? Sure. So there's a you know, a number of states where you can do it entirely online. Mm. Um, and that is, you know, so let's use an example here. So like, you know, Alaska, right? So Alaska, there, each state makes up their own rules around concealed carry licenses, right? You know, Alaska, you know, is what's known as a constitutional carry state, which basically means that they don't have to even have a license. You can carry mm. and you don't need a license. It's just, it's assumed mm. it's part of the constitution. Arizona is the exact same way a lot of states are. So there's a number of states that don't even require any training whatsoever, right? And then there's other states that require a ton of training. And there's some states who ultimately it's almost impossible to actually get a license, even if you were, you know, on SEAL Team 6 and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Cause there's a, you know, and, and then at the end of the day, it's a, that's their prerogative. It's their state. They can choose what they want to do. Mm. Um, you know, I'm very laissez faire, you know, in, in those types of things. So, but uh, yeah, there's a number of states you can do it online. There's a number of states like here in Minnesota, uh, where I'm from, where, you basically can do your classroom portion online and then you come and we do an in-person shooting test uh, with an instructor who's certified and they walk you through everything. Um, and there are some states that require 100% in person. Um, mm -hmm. So it depends on the state on what we do, um, but it's on a very state-by-state -state basis. But wow. it's been kind of fun building that out and we've had had that built out for years and everything and put tens of thousands of people through our courses, uh, which is great. Um, we're one of the largest in the country and everything. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's just giving people that opportunity to do, sort of build out that portion of their uh, of their skills, right? You know, and you know we're not forcing it upon anyone. It's just more so their their choice, and we just want to give them a, an opportunity to do that, right? So yeah, yeah. So so interesting. The, the pandemic forced everybody to go remote um, back in March, and then we also have an election year. I mean, did. What effect has that had on your business, those two things coming together? Oh, sure, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, becoming like a perfect storm here. So, you know, usually the firearms industry and everything, the training industry and, you know, a lot of other aspects of that um, work the opposite of normal economic conditions, right? So in down economies, we actually do better, right? In times of uncertainty, we we typically do better. And in times of, you know, political kind of elections and stuff we do better. And at the end of the day, you know, the psychology, you know, that people have and what motivates them to do these courses. And we don't do any advertising to try to push people over or any type of fear advertising, but um, people get concerned. And I think some people get fearful about what's gonna happen, right? So during the pandemic, you know, in March, we started seeing a pretty significant spike in our business, right? And what that basically came from, it was driven by was, you know, individuals who, you know, you can't find toilet paper on the store shelves, food is hard to find on the shelves in some places. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think people are concerned over civil unrest, right? Like, if people can't get food, are they going to come to my house and, and try to get that? So, you know, that's when our training spiked there, you know, um, and then there was, a, you know, obviously, various things of civil unrest and, and whatnot, it started in May, actually here in Minneapolis, 
Um, a lot of peaceful protests, of course, you know, but, you know, I think when people started seeing some buildings burn, they got concerned for their family's safety and then their own safety. Mm-hmm. So a lot of individuals, we saw another spike there who, you know, want to be able to protect themselves, right? And you can see that nationally, you know, if you look at the, the number of background checks for gun purchases, right? You see these, these, you know, a little bit of a spike during the pandemic, and then you see a big spike in May. Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of sustained now through the, you know, up to the election here and depending on how much direction it goes you know people are concerned they might lose their their ability to own a gun you might see you know more people trying to get that uh, now and hopefully be grandfathered in um and the opposite can happen if they don't have that concern so it just it's kind of a little bit of a roller coaster um in the market and everything and at the end of the day we're just trying to service our 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 you know customers uh yeah. to be able to try to give them the most uh most access, you know, possible, especially with, you know, customers who are, you know, higher risk, right? Being able to do a class online mm-hmm. and get your license in some states, they'll let you do it through the mail now, uh, which is really, really nice. A lot, you know, we service, you know, you know, a large portion of the country who can do it entirely online now and entirely through the mail to get their license. Um, so it's it's been nice for, I think, people who are high risk for coronavirus. You're like, hey, I don't really want to go out, you know, and drive downtown to a sheriff's office or spend you know six to eight hours in the classroom i'd rather do this you know course online in a couple of hours and then you know get my permit through the mail and everything you know so it's it's i think it's been a, a nice advantage for them to be able to do that right mm-hmm. wow well this has been quite interesting chris i want to thank you for your time today um mm-hmm. And I wish you good luck. And um, hopefully you, your business continues to flourish, but I think you probably could use a little bit of a break soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, we got to let you go. The, things might settle down in a week. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, you never you never know, right? So at the end of the day, you know, it's just, it's, you got to make hay while the sun shine and everything. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, not in a greedy sense or anything like that, but, you never know what's going to happen in the future. So, you know, we just want to make sure that we're doing a good job, you know, servicing clients. And, you know, like you're saying at the end of the day, like being able to have a flexible workforce, you know, not domestically or domestically, you know, remotely ultimately is kind of a really nice advantage to be able to contract and, you know, grow with, uh, with you know, these micro changes inside of the, the market, you know? Yeah, I agree. So, well, thanks again and have a great day. Thanks. Have a great one, Mark.